I want you to hit me as hard as you can. This legendary hero warrior man conquered and literally kicked ass in the world of martial arts, then succeeded in a great transition to Chinese Hong Kong Kung Fu cinema, topping it off with a magnificent career in the land of Hollywood land. Jet Li is 5 foot 6 inches of pure badass, always delivering exciting fight scenes, and every single time he is punching, kicking, and pushing the envelope, Jet Li never lets us down. And unlike a lot of other action stars, this dude has range. He doesn't play just a mindless kicking machine in every movie. No, 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 he can play many different characters, many different moods. Vulnerable, brutal, powerful, hurt, noble, kind, evil, and dog. But lately it seems like we're seeing less and less of this warrior poet. But why? Why, I ask, why? Now join me and my trusted research team, a guy named Brad, as we go head to head in a battle to discover the answer to the question. A WTF question. And WTF stands for what the f in case you were wondering. So yeah, what the f what the f happened to Jet Li? <laughs> but to truly understand what the f happened to Jet Li, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when he was born on his birthday, 1963, Beijing, China. His father passed away when Jet Li was only two years old, and his family was then forced to live in poverty. And in China, their, their wonderful, glorious government has the power, the unquestionable power, to pick slash force your children into a summer activity. And for Jet Li, luckily his government assigned summer activity was martial arts. Wushu style, if you if you care about styles. Li was a natural and quickly joined the Beijing Wushu team. By the age of 11, Li was competing against adults and beating them. He became a national all-around champion. And this was around the time when Bruce Lee had just passed away. So of course, the Chinese movie industry was on a desperate search for the next Bruce Lee. And there was a hotshot fat cat movie producer who saw young Jet Li fighting and asked the young boy if he wanted to be an action star when he grew up. And with an enthusiastic yes from young Jet Li, that producer came and watched young Jet Li fight every year until he was old enough to take on the Chinese movie industry. Which I don't think you're ever old enough to take on that. The Beijing Wushu team even came to America as a goodwill friendship mission and performed in front of everybody's favorite president, Richard Milhouse Nixon, who asked young Jet Li to be his personal bodyguard. Some say he was joking, but Nixon wouldn't joke about that. But young Jet Li quickly responded with a respectful no, no thank you, saying that when he grows up he does not want to protect just one individual, he wants to defend his one billion Chinese countrymen. And this answer pleasantly surprised the crowd, and even Henry Kissinger called young Jet Li a great diplomat. There was also a rumor that Nixon had bugged the hotel rooms of the Beijing Wushu team and were spying on them. Cause, you know, China. And to test this rumor, young Jet Li would talk to himself and ask the secret hidden microphones for things like ice cream. And wouldn't you know it, the next day, mysterious ice cream had arrived. Delicious Nixon flavored ice cream. I opened the door, anything I asked on the table. I thought, wow, that's true. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> the acclaim that Lee garnered as a master of martial arts led perfectly into starring roles in the Chinese slash Hong Kong film scene. And there he was given the nickname Jet because he's so fast like a jet and his birth name was too hard to pronounce. 
Jet Li came out of the gate strong playing a monk in the groundbreaking kung fu film Shaolin Temple in 1982. Jet Li was only 17 years old. This film was the first kung fu movie to be shot in mainland China and sold over 300 million tickets, making it one of China's highest grossing films. Adjusted for inflation. The film Shaolin Temple is credited with reviving the actual Shaolin Temple, making it a popular tourist spot. And the film spawned two in-name-only sequels that weren't as well received. Kids from Shaolin, and Martial Arts of Shaolin in 1986. Also in 1986, Lee would hop behind the camera for the first and only time in a movie called Born to Defense. Then, in 1991, Lee would officially earn that action star status that he was searching for, with the Hong Kong martial arts film Once Upon a Time in China, playing a real-life folk hero. The film and its sequels are highly regarded in China and Hong Kong, and are credited with kicking off a massive martial arts craze in the early 90s. Y'all remember the early 90s? It, it, it was crazy! <laughs> Lee would then star in a series of respected China slash Hong Kong martial arts films, such as Dragon Fight in 1989. Yeah, Dragon Fight. <laughs> In 1992, there was a movie called Swordsman. Also, 1992, that year, would bring us The Master. The following year, which is 1993, would bring The Legend, which made him a legend, and Tai Chi Master. <laughs> Oh, let's not forget Kung Fu Cult Master. I love that title, Kung Fu Cult Master. Then the following year, 1994, would bring The New Legend of Shaolin. And The Defender, which is also known as Bodyguard from Beijing. A lot of these movies have two titles, so it's kind of confusing. Then he did The Unthinkable and starred in a remake of the legendary Bruce Lee film, Fist of Fury. Changing the title slightly to Fist of Legend. And it was like, what, you're remaking a Bruce Lee classic? How dare you? What are you thinking, Jet Li? That is really, really risky, but the risk paid off. And Fist of Legend has gone down as one of the best martial arts films ever made. Wow. In 1995, Lee would appear in an action comedy called High Risk about a bodyguard and stunt double for a cowardly martial arts film star, which Lee would later discover was based off of Jackie Chan. And Lee said he would have never agreed to have been in a movie that would make fun of Jackie Chan in such a way. Disrespectful. Because Jet Lee respects Jackie Chan. So yeah, High Risk. It's, it's Jet Lee making fun of Jackie Chan without realizing it. <laughs> But Jet Li did not enjoy working in Hong Kong because the film industry was controlled by the underground mafia. And that's never a good thing, and Jet Li was very uncomfortable with uh, working with the mafia. For some reason. He even hired an agent to get him out of his contract. Then tragically, that agent was murdered. Mysteriously. What many see as a mob hit. Yeah, it's, it's a f dirty business. But Lee would continue to make films, such as My Father the Hero in 1995, there was Dr. Way in the scripture with no words, 1996. Also in 1996, there was a cool movie called Black Mask, 
The fight choreography is absolutely fantastic, but I mean, that can be said with every Jet Li movie. And 1998 brought us a movie called Hitman. Then Jet Li would make the epic quest and travel west, making his Hollywood debut. And even though Li was a huge star in China slash Hong Kong, his career as a famous movie star did not make him rich over there, because China, and at times he was almost making nothing for his films. Extremely little, like unbelievably low amounts of money. So he was inspired by Jackie Chan to go overseas. So Jet would jet over to the land of opportunity. The United States of Hollyweird. You know, living that American dream. But Jet Li would soon find out that a short Asian man who can't speak good English wasn't just gonna be handed the keys to Tinseltown. He had to fight for it, like with everything in his life. His big break would come with the sequel to Lethal Weapon 3, called Lethal Weapon 4. In Lee's previous films, the, the ones in Asia, he always played the hero. But for his Hollywood debut, he would go evil for the first time. And for Lee, playing a bad guy was a real moral crisis for him. Even at one point asking the director, do I really have to play the bad guy? Of course, the role was originally offered to Jackie Chan, who refused to play a villain, because Jackie Chan has to save the day in every frickin' movie, but Jet Li just has to kick ass in every movie, no matter who the character is. Americans loved Jet Li's evil introduction. I remember the first time seeing the trailer for Lethal Weapon 4 and, and being like, wow, who's that? I can't wait to watch this rated R movie that I'm not allowed to watch. But his fans over... It, in Asia, they were not sure they liked seeing their hero break bad. But it was a risk that Jet Li had to take. And he didn't really have many options. And as you know, at that time, Jet Li did not speak English very goodly. So he had to learn the language of English while making this movie. And since Jet Li was such a strong presence on film, they really wanted him in this movie. So the script was rewritten reworked and they cut down most of his dialogue, thus creating his strong silent persona, which was perfect. Director Richard Donner had asked Jet Li to slow down his martial arts moves because he was moving too fast for the camera. The camera couldn't actually register his moves. Think about that, the dude was moving faster than modern technology, well, 1998 technology, which is pretty modern. In the, in the sense of, of, of things and space and time and the history of all, all things. The film grossed over 285 million box office buckaroos off a $140 million budget, so that's good. And Jet Li knew that he was accepted by Western audiences when he was nominated for Best Villain at those MTV Movie Awards. Then came the new millennium, the year 2000. And as you know, since he had just played a villain, a bad guy, in Lethal Weapon 4, he had to play the hero in his next movie. And producer Joe Silver agreed to make him a good guy, giving Lee the starring role in a movie called Romeo Must Die opposite the late great Aaliyah. Producer Joel Silver said that he had become bored with American action films at that time, so he turned to Hong Kong cinema to find something fresh for American audiences and Jet Li, well, he was that, that fresh something. Romeo Must Die pulled in a respectable $91 million on a $25 million budget. Critics found Jet Li incredibly impressive in this film, but when he wasn't on screen, they said the movie was boring. Oh no, you don't want your movie to be boring. That's no good. I can hit a girl. 
And at this time, Jet Li would learn a few things about being an international movie star. Unfortunately, being an international movie star means you're gonna have a lot of people, a lot of different people, diverse people to please, and you ain't gonna please everybody. Some fans in some countries expect some things from you, and other fans in other countries expect another thing, like playing the bad guy in Lethal Weapon 4. So his performance in Romeo Must Die was actually disappointing to some kung fu purist movie geeks, because they didn't like the wire work, and the quote-unquote distracting hip-hop soundtrack. Also, there was some controversy with Jet Li, who, you know, happens to be an Asian person, and Aaliyah, who, you know, happens to be a black person. And the controversy came when those two people of different races were romantically connected in a movie. And that made people very uncomfortable, because China and, 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 and racism and, and stuff and things. It's not good. And in order to try to please racist people and non-racist people all over the world, they ended up not pleasing anybody. So they included the love story, but there were strict rules about physical touching between these two people who happened to be of two different races. Ironically, with a guy named Romeo not being able to really be romantic with his leading lady. I think Aaliyah like touches him on the cheek and then maybe pats him on the back. It's, it's the love story of our time. So Jet Li was struggling to balance multiple cultural elements in his films, which is kind of ridiculous. He should have just focused on making good movies, you know? But Jet and the studio had to consider some uncomfortable truths because, uh, that show business. <laughs> Jet Li himself would come up with the story for his next film, Kiss of the Dragon. And yet again, Jet Li was too fast for modern technology, 2001 technology, and the fight scenes had to be slowed down in post-production. They fixed it in post. Cause you just, you couldn't clearly see what he was doing on screen. It was just like zip, 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 zip. What, what, what was that? I don't know, it was too fast. 24 frames per second ain't gonna catch that. And this film is actually famous for not using wires or CGI for the fight sequences, as Jet Li was perfectly capable of performing all the stunts. Without any assistance, get out of here, wires, you're fired. We don't need you. The movie, Kiss of the Dragon, used more realistic fighting techniques similar to Jet Li's earlier films. The film went on to make $37 million. It received mixed reviews, most agreeing that the martial arts in the film were breathtaking, but many found the violence to be a bit too much and the plot to be a bit too little. Later in the year 2001, he would make a sci-fi movie called The One about a man who travels through a multiverse to kill versions of himself in order to be, you guessed it, the one. The film pulled in a not too shabby $72.6 million worldwide off a $49 million budget, but the film was heavily criticized for burying Jet Li's natural martial arts talents under special effects and fast editing. No need for these special effects and, and this editing you speak of. Cut out the cuts. <laughs> Lee would then return to the Chinese produced film Hero, where he plays the, the unnamed hero, the, the protagonist. And he actually turned down a role in the Matrix sequels for this. Looking back, it was the right move, because everyone hates the Matrix sequels except for the people that, that are wrong. At the time of Hero's release, the film was the most expensive film to ever be produced by mainland China, but it did have a hard time making its way over to the USA. Miramax was finally convinced to release the film after they were pressured by Disney executives, the Chinese government, and filmmaker Quentin Tarantino. So finally, in August 2004, it was released. 
where it became the first ever Chinese language film to open number one stateside and remained there for two weeks. Have you ever met a person that thinks when a, when a movie says Quentin Tarantino presents that it means that he directed it? Yeah, I hate that. The film made $53.7 million in the United States and Canada and remains the third highest grossing foreign language film in North America. Go, hero, go. Hero was even nominated for Best Foreign Language Film at the Academy Awards, and ranked one of the top 100 action films ever made by Time Out Magazine. The film has been called everything a martial arts fan could ask for, with Roger Ebert even saying that the film transcends action and violence and moves into poetry, ballet, and philosophy. But Jet Li's performance in Hero is truly timeless. His skills and his talent in this film are almost, almost on a spiritual level. Hero. <laughs> then his next movie was Cradle to the Grave in 2003, starring opposite the late great DMX and Tom Arnold. The film received mostly negative reviews because the movie's dumb. Yet, as in the case with all of Jet Li's American films, reviewers made sure to point out that Jet Li was the bright spot in this horrible movie. Cradle to the Grave cost a reported $25 million and pulled in a $56 million box office, making it a moderate success. And when successes are moderate, it's still, it's still successful. Then in 2004, Jet Li and his family were almost lost forever when that horrendous tsunami hit that took the lives of so many people. Jet Li and his family were, you know, wrong place, wrong time. And Jet Li's own daughter was almost swept away. The water quickly rose over Jet Li's head as the wave washed over them. And through his quick thinking and actions, he was able to save his daughter. And like with so many other people who had loved ones in these areas, the world went a few days without knowing whether or not Jet Li and his family had perished. But because of Jet Li's quick thinking and the bravery of strangers, he and his family made it out. And it was this near-death experience that changed Jet Li's soul forever. So, you know, he did the pay it forward thing and he set up a foundation called one i'm not sure if it has anything to do with the movie the one probably doesn't but this charity one it does some great work thanks to Jet Li. and yeah after this horrible experience he started dedicating more of his time to charity work like reconstructing the island and helping other victims survivors Jet Li truly is a hero on and off the screen. Without asking what's your country, where you're from, what's your religion, they just help each other and uh, say, if I'm survived this time, I will change my life. Because Jelly already dead. Next move, Jelly living to show the love to the world. Do everything I can to help people in the future. Now, let's get back to talking about stupid things like movies. His next movie was called Unleashed in 2005. He would reunite with his Kiss of the Dragon screenwriter, Luc Besson, for this movie that in France is known as Danny the Dog. So whether you call this Unleashed or Danny the Dog, I think we can all agree that this is a wild, crazy, wonderful flick. And Besson, Luc Besson, wrote the film specifically for Lee. The film earned decent reviews. Most people appreciated this film. And Unleashed gave Jet Li more to do than just punch and kick. He actually got a chance to act, you know, alongside Morgan Freeman. So a lot of people consider this his best English language film. I really like it. I think it's interesting because he's like, he's like a guy who's like a dog. 
but it's not like one of those Tim Allen movies. That was probably the worst way to describe this movie, but I'm, I'm gonna just keep it. The film was only estimated to make 18 million dollars, but it ended up pulling in 24.5 million. So good job, Danny the dog, good boy. Who's a good boy you are? Yes you are, Danny, Danny the dog. Unleashed. And Jet Li's rapid rise to stardom can be actually seen in the title of his next movie, Jet Li's Fearless. Yes, now the name Jet Li alone was marketable in the United States. The film was widely praised for its impressive choreography. Look at that choreography, it's so impressive! In Hong Kong, the film made an impressive $30 million, making it the highest grossing film of the territory that year. It's a territory. And it finished its North American run with $24.6 million, making it the eighth highest grossing foreign film in the United States. Fearless. Jet Li's Fearless. And by this point, Jet Li seemed to have proven his point in Hollywood and went back to starring in mostly China-slash-Hong Kong productions, with the occasional Hollywood role thrown in for good measure. In the year 2007, we would see Li win Best Actor at the Hong Kong Film Awards for his performance in The Warlords. The film's budget was $40 million, with $15 million of those dollars going to Jet Li's pocket. He deserves it, I'm just saying. Also, in that year, 2007, Lee would appear opposite fellow badass Jason Statham in the movie War. What is it good for? Well, it, it's good for this movie. And Lee actually said in several interviews that he had no confidence in the film's director and that the movie sucks. Jet Li said that halfway through filming the movie, he knew that War was going to be a critical and commercial failure. Which is weird because everybody loves war. And he was not wrong, the film was labeled boring and full of cliches. And everybody hates boring cliches. They're, they're the worst. War pulled in $22 million in the United States. Then came the year of the rat, 2008. This year saw the highly anticipated team-up of martial arts legends Jet Li and Jackie Chan in the movie The Forbidden Kingdom. Jackie Chan and Jet Li loved working with each other. Jackie Chan even said that shooting the fight scenes were relaxing and easy for him because he was so comfortable working with Jet Li. They each understood each other's similar trainings and similar rhythms and reactions. It's like a dance. Jackie Chan says that it is not unusual to have like over 10 takes while filming an action scene. But with Lee, they did not have to shoot these over and over and over again. He was pretty much perfect every time. Reaction to the film was mostly positive, with most people saying that the highly anticipated collaboration between Lee and Chan did not disappoint in the fight scenes. But those pesky critics did say that the film lacks in pretty much every other category. <laughs> <laughs> Every filmography should have a mummy in it, and for Jet Li, that mummy was the mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor also known as The Mummy 3, because it's the third one. And since Lee is a very busy guy, he was only available for part of the shoot, hence why a lot of his scenes are... CGI Jet Li. But even CGI Jet Li is, is great. Look at him, he's, he's made of terracotta. But unfortunately, this is probably the most hated of that Mummy franchise. Many saying that it lacked the fun of the first two, and... Yeah, it kind of did, even though it has, like, epic stuff in it, like, there's, there's freaking yetis. But Roger Ebert, the guy with the thumbs, he, he's a big fan of The Mummy 3, claiming that he likes the film because it is just plain dumb fun. If you say so. 
The film is the lowest grossing of the Mummy franchise, pulling in $401 million worldwide, and to most, that number would be a hit, over $400 million, but to Universal, it was a franchise killer. So Jet Li officially killed the Mummy, and then we got that Tom Cruise nonsense, which makes The Mummy 3 look like a masterpiece. In 2009, he appeared in a very controversial film called The Founding of a Republic, and the following year, 2010, he was in a highly praised dramatic film called Ocean Heaven. But then Jet Li would join the team of probably the most badass team ever put on screen, The Expendables. A true collaboration of true badasses making a, a pretty good movie, I guess. The best part of this movie is just reading the poster. I'm like, oh my gosh, all those people are in it. And when you read Jet Li's name, you're like, yeah, he, he fits. He, he deserves his place amongst those expendables. And being an expendable actually means you're not expendable. If that makes any sense. The film was a massive hit, pulling in $274 million worldwide on an $80 million budget. You get to see action legends just being action legends next to each other. It may not be a great movie, but it's a great thing to watch. <laughs> 2011 saw the release of The Sorcerer and the White Snake. A film that Lee was tricked into taking because the producers claimed that he wouldn't do much fighting in it, yet, once filming began, he realized it was quite the opposite, saying that the film was far more exhausting than his other films because he was fighting a bunch of untrained people, which just makes it hard for everybody. Then Lee would split his time between his Eastern and Western productions for Flying Swords of Dragon Gate and The Expendables 2, which were being filmed at the same time. The original script for Expendables 2 had an entire subplot to be filmed in China, with Lee playing a major role. But there were lots of complications with the Chinese government and Lee's schedule. Thus, Sylvester Stallone just came up with the idea of Lee jumping out of a plane over China, and then you never see him again, until Expendables 3. The year 2013 would see Lee appear in an action parody called Badges of Fury. It was a Hong Kong-produced film that was poorly received and quickly forgotten. Then came the year 2014, and Lee would appear again in an Expendables movie. This time it's the third one, so they call it Expendables 3. And he's only featured in about five minutes of the entire film. And it's the first PG-13 entry of the series. And the worst reviewed and the worst performing. And for quite a while, this would be Jet Li's last Hollywood film, until Mulan. In 2013, Jet Li went public with the news that he had been suffering from hyperthyroidism. And around that time, a photo of Lee found its way trending on the internet, where Lee has appeared to have aged many years. I, myself, and other fans became very worried about Lee's health. And in the year 2016, when Lee released his Hong Kong fantasy film League of Gods, he said that he was taking fewer film roles to focus on his charity work with the Red Cross Society of China, and his own, The One Foundation. And that stepping away from the film industry had nothing to do with any health concerns. I don't know, he does look really not good in that photo, but his manager just said that it was horrible lighting and a bad angle, which made him age like 30 years. I don't know, the photo is not flattering and caused a lot of rumors to spread because, you know, it's the internet, that's what it does best. But Lee and his manager insist that the picture is not a representation of his health and has been greatly over-exaggerated. So yeah, many people were very, very concerned. 
rumors were everywhere that, that the dude was falling apart. And this may shock you, I'm not a doctor or anything, but they say he's doing great. And I'm going to choose to believe them. And I'm so happy that you're, you're, you're doing better, Jet Li. And we here at the Joe Blow Movie Network wish you nothing but healthy days. I mean, we wish that for everybody, but, but this video isn't about everybody, it's about Jet Li. You are a mighty warrior. Rise up like a phoenix. Fight for the kingdom and its people. But then came Mulan in the year 2020. And any fears of Jet Li's diminishing health were put to rest when photographs of the movie's premiere were released and Jet Li was looking fine, fresh, young, and vibrant. So it was like, okay, he's good, he's good, he's healthy, everyone. Uh, whew, nothing could stop Jet Li. Like, tsunamis, diseases, the Hong Kong Mafia, bad reviews. Nothing can take him down. Li had originally turned down the role of the Emperor in the live-action adaptation of Mulan, Disney Plus, because he did not like the script or his paycheck. But his daughters convinced him to do the movie and told him that it was important for a company as big as Disney to shine light on the Chinese culture. So Li accepted the role. And unfortunately, due to the shutdown, you know, 2020. Mulan will go down in history as one of the first major motion pictures to not get a theatrical release because of the pandemic, making its way over to, to Disney Plus. And you could pay $30 to watch this on Disney Plus, or just wait a few weeks until it's on Disney Plus. It did make $70 million worldwide despite the limited availability, but the film's production faced much controversy. You know, because China. Every family will supply one man. We'll protect our beloved people and crush these murderers. There is no other way to say it. Jet Li is the ultimate badass. In a world where muscle-bound macho men defined a genre, Jet Li came along with his 146-pound frame and put them all to shame. He showed Western audiences a style of action hero and villain that we had never seen before. So I just want to say thank you, Jet Li, for all of the great films. And nobody, not nobody, should give a f about what the f happened to Jet Li because he has left his mark on the art of cinema and the art of martial arts and his charity work, too. Gotta mention that. Even if all of his movies did not exactly live up to expectations for everyone around the world, you always loved seeing Jet Li on the screen, just being a level of awesome that only Jet Li could be. His focus seems to be more on his charity work than his movies nowadays. Good for him. But whatever he does next, I will be there alongside many others, moving our arms around and kicking our legs, mimicking this legend as we sit back and munch on our popcorn. And I'm sure that the next Jet Li is out there watching his movies too, and training. And who knows, maybe it could be you. Or me. No, it, it, it's not me. But it's definitely you. And that's what the f happened to Jet Li. <laughs>